Good evening, everybody. Thank you very much uh, for coming along. It's, uh, it's great, it's a lovely evening, and it's a good place to spend it. Um, thank you uh, to Philip as well for having to organize this and, and putting it together, and of course, the Frontline Club, and of course, the panel. Um, Sam Kiley, uh, I'm afraid, can't make it. Uh, Griff is here. I'm not going to do all the <laughs> biogs because you can read them for yourselves. Uh, Professor Richard Whitman standing in for Alan Menon, which we're very pleased about uh, at the end. And uh, Mary, uh, again, you've got the biogs. The uh, next few, well, a couple of hours, Max, Max, we want to be out of here by half past nine for a bunch of reasons, not least that there's a bar and there's restaurants and we've all got homes to go to. Um, Philip's going to talk for about 10, 12 minutes to lay out uh, his thoughts, perhaps tell us what his plans are for June the 23rd. <laughs> we'll see. Come out. Uh, you can feel free to tweet that. Um, and then we will also we'll have between three and five minutes each from the panel. Now, the thing about the panel is, and this is the key thing, is that we have all been to meetings where people drone on and go over their allotted time. But the good news is, we have assembled a panel that does not do that. <laughs> does, does it? They've got three to five minutes to opening remarks. After that, we might have a quick chat between the few of us, and then let's all get involved in the conversation. Mobiles uh, to silent, please. Fire escape, as far as I can tell, is out of that window. <laughs> Failing that, down the stairs. <laughs> Toilets are right behind you, where, where they're just behind those uh, coat hangers are. It's a very fast-moving story, uh, this. Every day there's something new. I mean, this is the hot ticket tonight. There's something else going on a couple of miles away with some bloke called Boris and uh, someone from north of the border. But this is the ticket. And the story's changing all the time. I, I just went on the, um, the Euros Facebook uh, page, and I looked up um, the, the, the category for... Um, its status for currency, and it, and it didn't say single anymore. It said it's changed, it's complicated. <laughs> so it really is moving. What has been missing, and, and Philip and I have talked about this, from the debate really is this wider global perspective, and that's what we want to get on to tonight. Not stuff just inside the UK or even just inside the EU. What is the global perspective of what we are about to decide? And to lay out uh, his opening ideas on that. Philip, <coughs> please do go ahead. Thank you, Tim. Thank you very much. Um, thank you all um, for being here this evening. Um, welcome. I'm delighted that we are here in the Frontline Club to discuss Britain's role in the world ahead of the referendum on our membership of the European Union on 23rd of June. It is unusual um, for geopolitical questions to be on the front line of British national life. But for a nation like ours, in a world like ours, that's where these questions belong. It is a rare privilege to be in the same place as so many people for whom I have such great respect. It is a, a particular pleasure to welcome Professor Mary Cowdell, Professor Richard Whitman, and Griff Witter, and indeed Tim, who will be in charge of our discussion. It is very good of you to share your experience, your wisdom and your thoughtfulness to guide us through this subject. It does not seem possible that almost 20 years ago I began my clinical course on the medical front line at St Mary's Hospital across the road from here. Just over 20 years before that, Britain first voted in a referendum about our relationship with what was then called the European Community. And here we are again asking a very similar question. We cannot answer that question without first considering who we are as a country and what we want our future to look like. This evening is about a decision that affects our country, our world and our children's future. This is a decision that will reverberate for generations. It is about deep fundamental matters which neither campaign has done justice. It is about who we are. It is about our values, our ideals, our strength of purpose, and our duty to do good in the world as one of its leading nations. It is about cooperation in a world that is more connected than ever before, 
more conscious of its differences and of what we have in common. It is about our generation growing up and deciding the legacy we will leave the next. It is about being able to deal with challenges we will face in the future. No country, however powerful, can tackle future migration pressures, nuclear proliferation, pandemics, <coughs> climate change, and avert possible future financial crises on its own. Problems that cross boundaries have to be addressed by solutions that cross them too. Ladies and gentlemen, we have taken so much for granted for so long. We are fortunate to have grown up in a Europe that has been at peace for a longer period than at any time in history. Britain fought long and bravely, not only to bring about that peace, but to build the post-war friendships between our European neighbours that have sustained it. That generation had no hope of the comfortable lives it is possible to have today, but they dreamt of a better future, and that's what they knuckled down and built. For us, not them. In an uncertain and ever more perilous world, we must not take this peace, cooperation and friendship for granted. We must not turn away for the sake of an illusion of sovereignty that is obsolete in our interdependent world. We must not weaken ourselves and Europe dangerously and perhaps irrevocably. We cannot put our destiny and that of Europe at risk by voting to leave. <coughs> we owe it to future generations the lives of our children and their children to remain in the European Union. Over the next month, we will all witness the English, the Welsh and the Northern Irish competing with other European countries on French soil for the right to be called champions of European football. That our patriotism is now peacefully displayed on the pitch during such sporting battles is evidence of what I think we call European progress. Ladies and gentlemen, it is little wonder with such progress that people are driven to flee places where life is hard, to come to our great country. We will only ease pressures that drive migration by spreading the prosperity and security that we enjoy, by strengthening and not weakening the global order by enhancing the globalised economic growth that depends on that order, by promoting the values of peace, democracy and human rights that underpin it, thereby delivering the security, stability and prosperity the world needs. And everything that flows from that for the good of Britain, our health, our welfare, welfare and our defence. For all its flaws, the European Union created out of the post-war chaos the foundations for our unprecedented prosperity today. Foundations that won't be there if we leave. It has achieved much for us and can achieve so much more. But there are flaws. So our decision to remain must be more than that. We too must knuckle down and work for a better future. A vote to remain must be a vote to guide and strengthen Europe. And we must recognise that the European Union did not cause the problems we face. It did not make our country a second order power. Leaving is not a silver bullet that will solve everything we have got wrong. The opposite. The problems we face exist because we have, in the past, elected governments on promises to spend on the here and now, primarily on our own health and welfare. Because we prioritise that above investing for the future in science and innovation, in national capabilities and in international alliances. They exist because our society, our families, our communities and our professions turn their backs on our decaying social mobility and on the crying need to better integrate some of our immigrant communities. A decision to remain will boost those who are fighting against the forces of divisiveness and hatred already on the rise. The terror groups already active inside and outside Europe's borders. The threats beyond its borders. <coughs> radical anti-European parties in France, Hungary, Austria, Germany and elsewhere. A decision to leave would save very little, if anything. 
What we give the EU is the equivalent of approximately 1.5% of our annual public expenditure, or what it costs to run the NHS for about a month. By the way, that, that much criticised Brexit bus figure of £350 million would pay for just about a day of the NHS costs. Not that we could spend this rebate just on healthcare. What of farming, universities and other sectors that currently depend on EU funding? Ladies and gentlemen, the EU needs the UK, and the UK needs a better EU. This union we have helped to create may be flawed, but it is what we have got to work with. Destroying even an imperfect union now would be an act of strategic vandalism, and at the worst possible time. Undoubtedly, there is much work to be done. It is time for Britain to get on with it. Our strategic goal must be to become more ambitious, <coughs> more influential, more outward-looking for ourselves and for Europe. It is remarkable how much Britain has influenced and achieved through the EU, even though our commitment has not always been full-throated, which begs the question, what can we achieve when we actively engage? By 2030, we will likely be the largest economy in Europe and will possibly have its biggest population. Europe's control and direction, its security and its economic stability will always be a vital British national interest. Britain, with its global reach and European alliances, can remake the active, visionary and realistic union that is so badly needed. This is not only right, but simply too important to turn it away from. It is our duty and our responsibility as a strategic power. And we are not a nation that gives up when times get difficult. We arrive at this point in world history with a national legacy of making the world safer and more prosperous. Europe has enjoyed peace for over 70 years. To believe that we can rely upon that unprecedented peace and prosperity that our generation and the last have enjoyed is incredibly complacent. The world, we see more change, the world will see more change in the next 10 years than over the last 50. Europe is part of the global community we painstakingly assembled to safeguard our futures. Futures which depend more than ever on stronger, better international alliances. Britain has a responsibility to enhance these relationships to secure a more stable world. Ladies and gentlemen, if my daughter, who's sat over there more interested in her iPad, follows the same career path as me, in 20 years' time it could well be her that is walking out of those hospital gates opposite and across the road. I want her to inherit the same opportunities, the same prosperity, the same peaceful continent, the same global outlook that I looked out on 20 years ago. I can only give her that legacy, that future, if Britain is an active member of the European Union. For my daughter, for my constituency, and for my country, I will be voting Remain on 23rd of June and appeal to everyone else to do likewise. Future generations will judge us on this vote. It is our duty to make sure that their lives are as safe and decent as possible. That can be best achieved in a stronger Europe, a Europe at peace with itself, a Europe with Britain at its heart. Thank you very much. Thank you, Philip.